All right, ladies and gentlemen, coming up, I have an author on the line with me today, the one and only Mr. Brian R. Solomon, and he's going to talk about the book called Blood and Fire, the unbelievable real-life story of wrestling's original sheet, coming up after this. No, baby, that's for somebody else. We're just going to keep you right where you're at right now. The Wrestling Realm presents Break It Down with Brian H. Hey, what's going on, man? How you feeling? Hey, I'm doing okay. That is an incredibly cool intro you have there. That I'm like very impressed. No, I'm, I'm doing okay. I I'm, thanks for having me on. This is this is always fun to talk about the Sheik and whatever else. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, thank you um, for coming on. I know you've been real busy and doing a lot of interviews and stuff. So, um, and that, you know, that comes with, you say you've been writing a book for over two years, right? Like you was during the pandemic. So I guess more about yeah. three. Yeah, I actually started at the very end of 2019. So even like right before everything happened mm -hmm. and like the entire process from beginning to end was uh, about two and a half years or a little more yeah maybe like yeah like two and a half years total wow yeah <laughs> yeah so what was the um i, I want to know like you know what made you tackle this project especially like you hear about the chic especially in 2000 in the you know 2000s and 2010s and 20s but you know, most time when you hear the name Sheik, you think of an Iron Sheik. So what made you want to write about the original Sheik? That's one of the reasons what you just mentioned there, because, you know, I've even noticed in my own lifetime as a fan, you know, I've been a wrestling fan since the 80s. And like back then, even and into the 90s, the Sheik was still active and he was out there. He was old, but he was out there. And even though the Iron Sheik was a very big star because of WWF and on national TV and everything, most hardcore fans really knew the Sheik and they knew about the Sheik and they knew, okay, that guy is the real Sheik, you know? Mm -hmm. But as time's gone on, like with anything else, things start to fade. And I started noticing that, that his name and his importance had not been kept alive as much as some other people from that era that you hear about and you know for a variety of reasons so i thought like well, okay well i should probably tackle this because i don't think anyone's ever going to do it there had never been a book done he never did a book in his life or talked to anybody you know publicly so um i took it on yeah well yeah, it's amazing um one of the things that like for me personally the first time i really heard about it was through sabu you know, and people say that, you know, because that's his nephew and he would always pay homage to him. And I'm like, oh, OK. So, you know, you get on a Google machine and that's what you know, get educated on him. Uh, I saw like RVD did the forward, you know, what um, what was it like working with RVD on this project? Well, I knew Rob from my days working for WWE. So I was um, I was an editor and a writer on WWE's magazines in the 2000s and during the whole time that rob was there and had like his really big run there and so i had known him from that time so i felt like we and, and we touched base over the years since then i felt like we had a pretty decent relationship he's a very laid-back guy he's very approachable and he was somebody that i knew had a direct connection to the sheik so i just thought i mean what an opportunity there's not a lot of people around who have a connection like that to him and I decided to kind of see if our friendship still held up and it did. <laughs> and he did it. I mean, he really did it. That's the thing I always make clear. Like a lot of times I hate to burst anybody's bubble, but like these introductions on books, not even just in wrestling, these like celebrity introductions, a lot of time they're not even written by the person. You know what I mean? It's like sometimes mm -hmm. the person will approve it or look it over. Sometimes they don't even approve it. And it's just like, whatever, put my name on it. But Rob really wrote it from beginning to end i mean like i fixed his typos but that's about yeah. it like i didn't change a thing those are his words yeah that's amazing now um yeah what was one of the things that like you know just knowing rob over the years what was one of the things that like one of the lessons that stood out from the sheik from him because like one of the things that you know he talked about in the forward was like you know just kind of having that respect because he was one of the sheik's boys and but also like they knew like you know he's going to 
you know, they were, you know, they had to be tough and stuff. So what was one of the things that stood out? I think, well, what surprised me when we would talk about it and a little of that is mentioned in the book is, you know, I would say like, well, what could you have, not that there's anything wrong with the Sheik. He had his style of working. If you've ever seen a Sheik match, there's not a lot of holds in the match. There's mm-hmm. not a lot of chain wrestling. He's not taking bumps. He's not going to the ropes. And I'm going like, what could you learn from this guy? It seems like his style was just his own. And Rob would tell me like, no, I mean, he knew how to do everything. He knew all the fundamentals. He could go in there and turn you into a pretzel and twist you all around. And like, he was actually a, an amateur wrestling champion in the army and he just didn't need to do it as part of his character. So he was like, he actually taught us the fundamentals of like how to really make it look like a fight, how to like, you know, work a, a really a match that really is believable and and you know rob would add his own flavor to it like sabu did too they had all their kind of aerial tactics and the acrobatic stuff which the sheik wasn't always crazy about you know so sometimes rob told me that they would wait until the sheik would go back in the house to like go to the bathroom or go to get something to eat and then he and sabu would just start flying all over the place and doing all the crazy stuff because the sheik really wanted them to like focus on the basics first you know but mm-hmm. that's what surprised me is that rob really and from his own words learned a lot about working from the sheep more than you would ever have expected wow and what about sabu like just getting to like you know having those conversations with him about his uncle well most of my own um you know what i got from sabu's experience was from his book um Mm. i i was not able to speak directly to sabu for this book but sabu's own biography which is a good book by the way scars silence and super glue it's called yeah i seen it quoted and right 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 and it came it came out a couple of years ago and it's a very like personal account he really opens up about their relationship and you know i was able to use a lot of that information and get some insight into the relationship because the sheik really helped to make him a star i mean he 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 launched him um, you know, I don't think Sabu would have been able to to have the career that he had without his uncle. Mm-hmm. And he would agree with that, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, no, I was just going to say he would agree yeah. with that for sure. I'm not saying anything that he would disagree with. Yeah, one of the things that was fascinating about this was uh, the kayfabe. Now, granted, things were different back then. But, you know, as you went into details about how he like was committed to kayfabe, have you seen anybody else like that that was as committed to kayfabe as the original sheep? Not to the level that he was. No. I mean, that's a simple answer. I mean, he came from a time when they did protect kayfabe more. I mean, now, you know, it's no one really cares about it at all unless you're actually on the show. And sometimes not even then, to be honest with you, it's pretty ridiculous sometimes. But with Sheik, it was like, you know, taken beyond even what the guys back then in the 50s 60s and 70s were doing you know they were trying to protect the business and they were trying to protect their livelihood you know but nobody committed like he did to the point where you know there was never a time in public where he was himself ever and and he had an extreme character so it's not like when you're talking about you know somebody like a terry funk or harley race or whatever where it's like okay at least they can talk you know, their, yeah. their wrestling personas allow them to talk and be somewhat like themselves. I mean, Harley Race was not that different from the Harley Race persona that you saw. But with the Sheik, you know, obviously he was not like that in real life. So he had to, <laughs> but he had to then maintain that wherever he went. And they said, like, in the locker room, because he was also the promoter, he would be Ed Farhat. He would be himself. And then the second the curtains opened, it was like he was a maniac and he didn't care who you were. He didn't care if he was just talking to you five minutes ago. He was going to try to kill you. And there was nothing you could do to get him to break character. And he committed to that for his entire life after he got into wrestling till the end, even after he left the business and retired. Now, um, for the younger fans how would you like what's the best way to compare him to like a bruno san martino because everybody knows you know especially because wwf can wwe can tell their story and their narrative 
But so everybody knows the name Bruno San Martino. Even like my kids, they would, you know, if they pay attention to it, they know it. What would you say, like, as far as like level comparison, as far as being over in popularity or just, you know, um, importance into the rest of the history? Well, you know, it's like you said, uh, some somebody like Bruno, people know him today partly because WWE is a powerful marketing machine, right? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, and if you've been watching for long enough, you know, before he went in the Hall of Fame, they never talked about him. So, like, <laughs> if you were a very young fan in, like, let's say the 90s or the 2000s, you may not have known who Bruno San Martino was. But when they started, you know, when they inducted him in 2013, they went all out in welcoming him back into the fold and making him like he's basically like what what Joe DiMaggio is to the Yankees. He is to WWE and they treat him that way, you know, but like without that machine of that to push you as a legend, you can be forgotten and it happens often. But the Sheik and I even kind of talk about this a little in the book, but I've said it before. He and Bruno. It's glad you mentioned him were like two sides of a coin like like the chic was like the anti bruno where mm. bruno was the hugest baby face the most beloved and you know sold out everywhere and a huge star and people believed in him and like loved him like he was like a sports star you know the chic was the exact opposite they hated his guts like legitimately wanted to kill him like wanted him dead and and he was a main event and a star everywhere he went. And there were periods like, and even in the observer, this has been broken down sometimes where they break down so like year by year, who was the biggest draw in the business. And you can look and see that Bruno San Martino and the Sheik were going neck and neck in that category in like the late sixties, early seventies. It would be like Bruno one year, the Sheik the other year. Bruno one year and 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 then if the other one was number one then the other guy would be number two so that's very in terms of like the box office you know mm -hmm. that's very but that but where it's important for the chic and it's impressive for the chic is that's very rare for a heel you know what I mean it's easy for a good guy to do that because you're the hero and everybody wants to come out and support you and they believe in you but it's hard when you're the bad guy to be and, and, you know, because the bad guy eventually has to lose and then you lose and you lose your heat and you have to try to build it up. So it was like this one solution that he had to that was he never lost. <laughs> he, mm -hmm. But you see, he was smart because he knew, like, I'm <clears throat> a heel. I'm a heel. If I <clears throat> if I start losing, I'm going to lose all my heat. And so he was very smart <clears throat> about that. And he was able to be the top drawing heel in the business for years, which, by the way, the Iron Sheik never was so that's why i say he was he was a bigger deal than the iron sheik the iron sheik was a big name but you could never say that he was like the top drawing card in the whole wrestling business i don't think anybody would ever say that but yeah, that's but, the true. Sheik, but the sheik reached that level in his time so what was it like um when you went to his family and you told him that you wanted to write this book what was their reaction like were they excited or they like what are you sure like what was their reaction well, I'd been told ahead of time that they were going to want nothing to do with it, to not even bother, that they had stonewalled people in the past and like refused. And because they were like, they would always talk about how they were planning to do their own book. But, you know, mm -hmm. years went by. The Sheik died. His wife, Joyce, died. The, the, the sons were getting old, Tommy and Eddie Jr., and nothing was happening. And so people started wondering if there even was a family book that was going to happen. So I figured, you know, what the hell? Like, I, I would actually like to see if I could get them involved. I started the process of the book first because I just thought in case they don't want to do it, I got to at least get started. I reached out to Eddie Jr. And, you know, at first he, he actually did get back to me. And then in the beginning, his first response was like, well, how could you do it? without us like how are you writing a book about my dad without talking to us and i was like well your dad was a historic figure you you know what i mean like i can write mm -hmm. a book about ronald reagan i don't have to talk to ronald reagan's family it would <laughs> right it would be nice yeah, it might help true. me but i could still write the book and i said that to him i said look i and i didn't mean it in a mean way we never had an argument i said i'm gonna write this book it's my book i'm gonna write it either way i would like to do it with you because I think, you know, you would be able to give me insight. No one has. And he, you know, I could tell he was very hesitant. There was never animosity. He never, like, told me to, you know, go to hell or anything. He was just like, 
stalling and stalling and stalling. And then what happened was that they wanted money and a lot of money. And it's just, that's just really not how something like this works. Like I can understand if we were making like a big multi-million dollar movie and the family's yeah. involved, but not a, a book. I mean, the book, books these days especially like i'm hardly being paid and i'm writing the book like mm -hmm. you know what i mean so i that kind of cooled things off like the the amount of like he wanted money that was like many times what i was getting paid to even write it so like at he but even beyond that he started to like really think about it and say all right maybe we're gonna help you but then there was like so much tragedy his his brother Tommy died of cancer while we were in the process of this. And then Eddie just was so depressed that he didn't really want to deal anymore. And he kind of just like just backed away. And then he died. He died of COVID. Um, uh, he died on the day that I finished writing the book. How crazy is that? Wow. But so the both of them were gone. And so it never really worked out. And I, I have to say now looking back and when it happened, I thought, OK, on the one hand, I didn't get the insight of the children directly. And I didn't get like the Sheik's baby pictures and things like that that they might have had. Right. But mm -hmm. on the plus side, I got to write the book my way. Like I didn't have to give up control. I didn't have to say, OK, well, you know, it's their book now. Like it was my book through and through. And so I'm kind of it, it kind of worked out in the end, I think. Yeah. And so what kind of advice would you give to somebody who would, you know, be interested in writing a book about a historical figure and, you know, especially in wrestling? Well, I think it, in wrestling, there's not enough independent biographies out there. Like most of what we see are autobiographies where it's by the wrestler or with a ghostwriter. And usually some of those books are good, but but usually those books are intended to they're trying to kind of put themselves over. They're trying to portray themselves. That's that's almost any autobiography, even outside of wrestling, you know, and sometimes it's a lot of BS and, you know, it's political. I think there's so much open ground out there for people that want to do independent biographies because those are the ones that tell the truth. So, it, you know, there's never been an independent biography of Ric Flair. There's never been one of Hulk Hogan. There's never been one of Bruno San Martino. You just mentioned he did his own book. You know, there's so many major stars, Roddy Piper. I mean, there's major stars that no one has ever tackled them independently. So, I mean, like, I think if you're going to do a book, you got to really stand your ground, make it your own book, have the tenacity to see it through, push it through, have your vision and don't get swayed and kind of like, you know, overwhelmed and, and have it turned into somebody else's book. Because if you, if you do stay the course, there's a lot of really good stories that are still out there to tell, honestly, for, for like third party biographers. And before we get out of here, I got to ask you this question. Is there any future books in your uh, plans? Of course I can't, I'm, <laughs> I can't stop now. This was yeah. my, this was my fourth book. And mm -hmm. I, I actually just completed my fifth book, which is non-wrestling related. Um, okay. it's, a, it's about the history of superheroes. It's called um, Superheroes, the, the uh, oh man, I'm on the spot now. I just finished. Superheroes, the, the, the history of, of, of pop culture's hottest phenomenon from Ant-Man to Zorro. I think that's well, the I title. I know I have a lot of friends who will be interested in that. <laughs> yeah, we're still working on it. Uh, the actual manuscript is done. The book will come out mm -hmm. in about a year. They want to have it ready for Father's Day of next year. Um, okay. But beyond that, because I'm done with that now, I'm just like wrapping it up. In terms, I am thinking of what my next wrestling book is going to be. I have a couple of ideas. I haven't, I'm not, I don't want to get too much into detail because people oh, still understandable. Ideas. But I will say this one idea I have is to do something on wrestling magazines, which no one has ever done a book about wrestling magazines. And the other thing is I do have a couple of biography ideas of people that have all, I'm not going to say who they are because people will steal it, but no, I'll just say this. I have two major names in mind that nobody has ever written a book about and they never wrote books about themselves and they're very big stars. So it would be like, it would be, they would be big. So wait and see. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's all. Awesome. You okay Brian, over there? <laughs> yeah. I don't, that's the, <laughs> got me. <laughs> but I, I definitely appreciate your time and I appreciate the book and, you know, appreciate you writing it. You know, like I said, I got a chance to learn a lot, you know, even like my mother who was responsible for my wrestling love, uh, 
she oh, that's good. I always told a story that when she was pregnant with me, she didn't like it, but she was on bed rest. And my grandfather, and my father would leave it on. And then she got hooked to Hulk Hogan. So, um, but I told her that, you know, I was going to interview you about, you know, the Sheik. And she was like, Iron Sheik? I was like, no, the original Sheik was one before him. So, you know, it was like, like you said, just being able to educate everybody on this is really cool. So I appreciate it. Thank you. That's one of the things that I wanted the book to be able to do, that even if you weren't around then, I mean, look, I wasn't even around for most of the stuff. I Mm -hmm. mean, you know, but it's there's still a lot that you can learn from the book about him, but also about the whole business and the history of the business. I really wanted the book to be that. So I'm glad that you enjoyed it in that way. Yeah, you know, and I definitely tell people like there's, you know, history about, you know, him and Abdullah the Butcher, you know, even the run ins with the WWWF and Vince McMahon senior. So definitely check it out. <laughs> Thank so, you, Brian. Appreciate it. Let the people know where they can follow you for those who sure. just listening on the podcast apps. Sure. A couple of things. So on uh, Twitter and Instagram, I'm Brian R. Solomon. And I also have a, an author page on Facebook called uh, Brian Solomon Writer. If you look that up, you'll find me there. I have an author web page, but the URL is a pain. So like if you go to my social media, you'll see the links for it. Also, I, if I could quickly mention, I have my own podcast, too. Um, yeah, absolutely. That I, I started it in February and it's part of the Arcadian Vanguard Network, which carries the Jim Cornette shows. That's kind of their biggest claim to fame with Brian Last. And but my show is called Shut Up and Wrestle. And yeah. it's a um, it's an old school podcast. So we only talk old school and I have all different guests. And what we talk about depends on who the guest is. Like I just had Baby Doll, who, you know, is an 80s wrestling legend. I had I've had Rob on there, Rob Van Dam. I've had the Blue Meanie on there. And I have even people that used to work in the corporate world of WWE with me. So, you know, I'm trying to make it a really interesting show with really, really good and unique conversations. And and you can find it anywhere you find podcasts, the usual places, um, except YouTube. But we'll get there. (laughs) It's called uh, Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian R. Solomon. I appreciate it, Brian. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. All right. Take care. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Break It Down with Brian H. Hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell so you get notified every time the wrestling realm post new content. All right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for checking out the interview that I just had with Brian R. Solomon. Um, as you know, with the wrestling realm, I, you know, sometimes, you know, we just open up the Patreon. And what you may not know is that we actually have a couple books to give away. So two people that we will be giving these books to are two of our Patreons and actually two of our longest, um, fans i should say two of our you know family and those two gentlemen are daryl johnson i don't know him as dr d and sean williams sean the shark williams so they will be having their book mailed out to him or i probably just do- give doc his uh but to all our patreons thank you thank you for your support and want to let you know that we will be having some more giveaways you know it's just a appreciation a token of thanks for your support of supporting the wrestling realm and everything that we do so long everybody